go. So if you would please go ahead and place yourselves on mute um, so that we have a nice clear um, recording. And I will introduce our guest speaker um, this evening. And thank you, Kat, for being with us. We really appreciate this. So uh, Kat uh, Jetris, did I say that right? Jetris is the state uh -huh. advocacy Advocacy Director for Death Penalty Alternatives for Arizona. I highly recommend you check out that website. DPAA is a statewide grassroots organization, meaning that it needs our support. And it's working to end the death penalty in Arizona and raise awareness about the inequities of the criminal punishment system. CAT has worked over the last six years with national and state nonprofits to raise awareness on felony disenfranchisement, reentry poverty, and health policies. She is passionate about rehabilitation outside the punishment system and working toward prevention of continued recidivism through restorative justice practices and policies, which we'll hear more about at the end of this month. So this ties right in with that. So Kat, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. And I am going to spotlight you and turn this over to you. Thank you so much, Kim. And it is so nice to see some familiar faces here and some many new faces. Um, so I really appreciate the introduction. Um, I'll give you a little bit more background about myself. And I really hope that we can make this an interactive presentation. Um, part of the background that I have is actually in comedy. So sometimes uh, the death penalty is not the most palatable conversation. It's not a dinner table conversation. I say all the time, no one comes home and this is the main topic of conversation. Um, and I think we have to find ways of having difficult conversations with our friends, our family, people within our circle who are most willing and receptive to take information from people that they know. So some of tonight's presentation, I hope will give you some things to think about, um, but also information to share with people that you know, um, who may not have this at the top of their, um, you know, their to-do list or things that they have going on. I know for a really long period of time, this, this subject matter really wasn't on anyone's um, mind because we didn't have the death penalty in Arizona active for almost eight years. So um, unfortunately this year, uh, things drastically and radically changed um, once executions started again. And um, I wanna give a brief history, some of the things that we're working on as an organization, and then ways to get involved, um, campaigns that we're working on, and just um, know that this is not a, an individual can change this entire uh, situation in Arizona. It took a long time for the system and, and the punishment system to get this bad and, and be so reactive. It's going to take a while to change it, but making incremental changes in the ways that we can uh, to the populations who most need help um, is the best start. Um, I am formally incarcerated. I share this openly because I think it's important that one, people know um, that people like me are, are wanted and needed in this space because I know firsthand what it looks like inside of Perryville. Um, I've been to uh, several of the male facilities. I talk to people on death row regularly. This is um, very personal to me, not because I was on death row, but I was maybe 200 yards from somebody who will never leave that yard. Um, for me, it was about 12 years, and I think about it every day, as do many people who have uh, an incarceration background do, but because it's so traumatic. But my experience and the stories that I heard compelled me to get into this work and to advocate for people who I shared lunch with. Um, and I know that the conditions inside are awful, but for the death penalty specifically, it is the ultimate punishment that if we get it wrong is irreversible. Um, for life sentences, for, for wrongful convictions, there's time, there's, there's plenty of time, unfortunately, to um, 
look at things again. But when it comes to this, it's if we get it wrong, there is no go back, do over. And it's something that ultimately creates more victims uh, to a already kind of tragic situation. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully it will work. Okay, um, I can't tell if people can see my screen. Um, Kim, can you? Okay, I saw a thumbs up. Um, so as Kim said, I'm the state advocacy director um, with death penalty alternatives for Arizona, DPAA for short, cause it's a lot of words there. <laughs> um, let me see if it's gonna, okay, there we go. So um, the last execution, well, Arizona doesn't have a great uh, track record with the punishment system, but we don't have a great track record with being uh, successful executioners either. Um, so the last execution prior to May uh, was about eight years and it was scheduled for 15 minutes and took almost two hours. And I talked to one of the attorneys who witnessed this and um, the testimony, his personal testimony was uh, something I, I wish every single person who had doubts about the death penalty could hear um, because it changed him fundamentally like it did Jimmy Jenkins. Once you see something like that, it's, it, it changes you. Um, Arizona doesn't have a great record of obtaining uh, things legally, <laughs> including the compounding drugs to make um, lethal injection. Um, there's no oversight to the process. DOC has a very, um, I'm, I'm sure most of you know, DOC is the Department of Corrections, has a very secretive um, procedural process, selection of people that they choose to complete executions. So very little information, very little information about the training is available um, that these individuals go through prior to an execution. Um, most, if not many, may not be um, licensed medical professionals. It's not a common thing um, that we have physicians and, and RNs and um, people really active in the medical field looking to um, support executions um, because it is against uh, the oath they take as medical professionals to do harm. Um, there's been no independent testing done on any of these compounds that have been used for any of the executions. Um, and then there are two methods of execution in Arizona, although um, it's not, both methods are not available to everyone. If you have a conviction before 1993, um, you have to choose between lethal gas or lethal injection. So you, you don't have to pick, it'll be deferred to lethal injection, but um, some individuals are faced with having to choose. I just am gonna play this short audio. Um, let me make sure I'm connected here. Um, but this is just a short clip. Um, unfortunately, we get some national uh, media coverage on how poorly we operate as a state um, with our lethal injection drugs. And unfortunately, there's a pretty good clip on John Oliver. If uh, you have HBO and watch him, he's kind of my uh, uh, comic relief to all the craziness, but uh, here he is just talking about our history. Oh, you can't hear it, Kim. Okay, let me just double check here. Sorry about that. You may have to exit and come back in and click share sound when you get ready to share your screen. Oh, I got it. I think I got it. Okay, let's see if this works. 11 and it's no longer approved by Better. the FDA for import into the country. Although some states have tried to weasel around that restriction. Five years ago, when Arizona needed drugs to execute an inmate named Jeffrey Landrigan, it purchased them illegally from a supplier operating out of this driving school in London. So um, those uh, drugs were obtained illegally um, from a driving school in London. Um, pretty shocking at what lengths the state will go to to break the law to ultimately kill someone. Um, 11, and it's no longer. Let's see if it'll go to, there we go. Um, 
One of the other things we do at DPA is take a look at the disproportionate um, demographic or, or uh, populations that are really affected by the punishment system and um, incarceration. So right here we have a graph or not a graph, an, oh, a chart that shows all the um, uh, races that DOC um, essentially measures on a monthly basis. At the bottom of this green and the darker green, you'll see what those um, statistics are by the census, by population. 14% of the people, almost 15% of the people who are incarcerated in Arizona are African-American they only make up 5.4% of the population. So one of our smallest percentages of the population is making up a really large disproportionate group of people incarcerated. Uh, you can see also that um, uh, indigenous people are also highly incarcerated. Also uh, Hispanic or Latinx groups are also highly incarcerated. Uh, it, not as much as just disproportionately as African-American people are, but this is a problem when we're looking at the numbers of what our, our population is comprised of. Um, and you see the exact same thing when you look at our death row demographics. These are um, shocking numbers for me to see, uh, particularly because I know that I, I've just seen so many studies done um, across the country on what numbers are supposed to look like. And unfortunately, we are very much part of the trend of racial discrimination that goes on inside the punishment system, but particularly for uh, the death row population. Um, we have 111 people on death row. Um, while that doesn't seem like an astronomical number, there are quite a few states that have less than 20, less than 50. Um, I'd say there are probably only maybe 10 states. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head that have um, such a high number as we do. On top of that, when you're looking at this, uh, I know it's a little hard to visualize here, but um, I'll go to the next slide. You can see what this actually looks like in a graph in our death row population. So disproportionate again, African-American, Hispanic and native um, much to a lesser degree, but black and Hispanic um, demographic populations here are disproportionately impacted by death row uh, incarceration. It's, a, it's approximately about 43% of the death row population are people of color. Um, and we know just from national statistics, uh, people who on, end up on death row, the, it absolutely matters uh, what race their victim was. Individuals who are not people of color um, have a much lower rate of um, death row sentences than those who have victims who are white. So this is something that you see across the country as a problem, but it is one of the things that we can change here in Arizona. Um, but it's important to know what our demographics look like, to know who we're advocating for, what challenges um, may have happened that are systemic problems, poverty, um, inequities in um, education, uh, inability uh, to get out of um, a space that may, you may just be uh, geographically stuck in due to poverty that has higher crime statistics. Um, these are really important to th things to think about as we kind of work through how do, we, how do we reduce the amount of people who are on death row? How do we um, advocate better for people who are um, turning over and going back into the population? Because most of the individuals on death row, it was not their first time in prison or their first encounter with um, the punishment system. Uh, some there's a you know a few rare runs, but most individuals had previous encounters before they got here. It wasn't zero to a hundred, and there's a pipeline 
that happens, the more turnover of recidivism, the higher chances you are to commit a crime that is going to get you here. But also it's going to hurt the chances when you go to sentencing, because now you have this long kind of trail behind you of um, crime that doesn't mitigate your circumstances. So to talk a little bit about who isn't gonna be on death row right now, um, in 2002, the Supreme Court ruled that those who are declared mentally incompetent, so th this would be more related to like IQ. It has nothing to do with mental illness at this point. It's solely related to like IQ testing, um, which depending on uh, the tester, time of day, uh, circumstances in which this goes on, this can be um, sometimes a challenging thing. Uh, for uh, defense attorneys to deal with. Um, and there are several people on death row who order between a few points above what the numbers are um, that could potentially uh, deter you from being on death row, but it's not enough. Um, in 2005, they also um, made a ruling the Supreme Court did on uh, offenders who are under the age of 18 should not be um, on death row. So if you're under 18 and you are um, uh, mentally uh, incompetent as the state phrases it, um, or disabled, low IQ scoring, you're not, you will not hopefully uh, have a consequence like this if there is a, if the crime is uh, that severe. Um, let me see here. So uh, I briefly talked about the two methods of execution and some of the problems, but one of the bigger problems that have come up in the last couple of court cases involving um, executions were the lethal injection drugs. The drug um, that's being used is called pentobarbital, and it's it doesn't have a great track record for better lack of word. Um, will it do the job? Absolutely, but is it um, is it, oh, is it, a, I'm sorry, I just saw a notification pop up there. Is it the most reliable drug? No, because one, human beings are administering these drugs. Um, we are flawed individuals as a collective. Um, and there's always human error that potentially could, you know, you could have everything set up right, but because human beings are, are doing this, uh, the likelihood that something can go wrong is very high. And it's not just an actual administration of the drugs, it's getting an IV in, it's um, preparing before, it's addressing any medical concerns that may be happening on the table. Um, and oftentimes what you'll see in other states, um, unfortunately, those who have some type of um, medical emergency while an execution is happening are left on the table. Um, or in the very rare case, they are resuscitated and then taken to the hospital, put back in prison and then rescheduled for another execution. Um, so they will literally bring you back to kill you. And that's, that's not enough. Um, we've spent almost $2 million the state has on just procurement of lethal injection drugs. Um, we don't know where these suppliers have come from. We don't know who's testing them. We don't know um, how they're being stored, kept. Everything is very, very secretive and it's extremely difficult to get information out. There are um, There is a statute specifically designed on secrecy with lethal injection drugs. So as a taxpayer, looking at, at it from the perspective of where is my tax money going? Um, a good chunk of it is going to the procurement of secret drugs um, to execute people. And while it may not seem like a lot when the DOC budget is $1.5 billion, there are so many problems with inside the prison system that could be fixed. Um, mental health, the healthcare system, uh, addressing a better reentry programs sponsored by the state. Any fractional amount of the amount of money that has been allocated to just this one thing and keeping people 
on death row with this kind of specialized watch that's very expensive on top of all the appeals processes could go into programming that could reduce the population in prison, that could reduce um, some of the strain on the healthcare inside the prison. Um, there are so many different ways, education allocations, um, so many different things that this money could be going towards, but instead people in Arizona are really left with going, I don't know what's going on. And it's purposely kept from you um, because it's shameful. Um, this is not something that the state wants to be very open about procedurally. And uh, like Kim mentioned earlier, if you go and read that article that Jimmy Jenkins wrote on his experience, you'll know why they keep it so tight, um, secured and secretive because it really does um, impact you. I have talked to so many witnesses uh, to executions, attorneys, um, Sister Helen Pergine, uh, who has seen so much. And, um, you know, they, I hope that no one ever has to witness something like that, but um, it is definitely something that if it was public, we would have more public outcry um, because it is something people don't wanna look at, don't wanna deal with and don't wanna see. Um, and it may, you know, victims definitely, I think, have different statements on what happens. And it's important to acknowledge victims in this process. Um, I know that's a, a difficult thing for a lot of advocates to address. And, I, you know, I've been outside of the prison. I've seen counter protesters. Um, I've had conversations with them. And the common thing is that it's hurt, it's pain, it's trauma. And what that's doing is it's also happening on the other side for the family of this person who's on death row, who didn't commit a crime, but is attached to it in the same painful way, um, except for, you know, they're a victim, you know, for the same amount of time as the other victim who's waiting for justice. Um, some, individuals on death row will wait as long as 40 years. Um, the average in Arizona is about 30. Um, and that's for those who have exhausted all of their appeals. Of the 111, the average time spent on death row is 16 years. So we're talking decades before anything, it, it, before they're even close to having any kind of action happen. And a lot of that time is because of the appeals process, but um, victims aren't getting immediate justice either in this. And it's extremely painful to go through the appeals process, which are essentially like second trials um, where their evidence, their stories, their loved ones are having to go through the exact same thing they may have gone through decades ago. Um, so this year we had two executions so far um, unfortunately, I believe there will be more. Um, Clarence Dixon uh, was 66 and was executed on May 11th. Um, Clarence was uh, schizophrenic his entire life. Um, he had been ruled um, not guilty by reason of insanity on a pre previous case, which is extremely rare. Um, um, former, or I guess I could say, um, Sandra D. O'Connor at the time, who was a judge, had actually ruled over this case um, when it was originally being um, tried, his case prior to um, this death penalty one. And she made the decision that he was not guilty by reason of insanity. He was supposed to be sent to a state hospital, but he was let out, uh, he was let loose on the street and within 48 hours committed the crime that um, ultimately got him executed um, and, and, and landed him on death row. Um, he had very little connection to reality at the time of his execution. Um, he was also blind. So not only are we taking a just someone who is completely impaired mentally, also physically, um, he, at his last words were, I don't know who this person was that essentially uh, I, I'm being convicted of killing. I hope I meet her. Um, 
he didn't know what was going on. And his attorneys at the time um, had had uh, shared some information with me that he believed that he was being um, executed for a crime that didn't result in um, a death, something previous, com completely different timeline. Um, so I truly believe that uh, Clarence had no idea what was going on. And this was a violation of his Eighth Amendment rights. But um, the state moved forward with it anyhow. It wasn't more than 30 days after that that um, Frank Atwood, who was executed, he was also confined to a wheelchair at the time of his execution. Um, he had chronic pain um, and was essentially disabled. Uh, he had also um, been heavily involved in his um, faith. He is Greek Orthodox and um, there were several requests that were made specifically on his religion that the courts wanted to fight through. Um, I went to his clemency hearing and there were over 150 people from his church that came and supported him and stayed almost eight hours through that clemency hearing to, su to support him. Um, I've talked to his wife. His wife has written a book um, and uh, she's a wonderful person. And this, she, this was by far um, one of the most challenging periods of her life. Um, while he was incarcerated, she was taking care of his parents. And um, this was incredibly hard on her. And she didn't know Frank prior to his incarceration. So out of the execution of him, we've created another victim um, for her and, and her. And I think when people think about executions, oftentimes from this perspective of uh, kind of retributive justice, we want to punish the person who we believe did something wrong, but in the process, we're not seeing the bigger picture behind them of all the people who are connected. Um, his mother, his father, his, um, his wife, um, all of those people were impacted by this. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that I think more people uh, should think about, but oftentimes this isn't the media narrative. Um, it's it's very short details and it's hard to kind of get to the root of what is the full picture and how we get there is really by sharing information and talking to one another about, hey, did you read this case or did you see this and doing more than just the 10 second kind of um, headline glance or uh, Twitter, you know, feed stream tweet that's on there that just says that this person is being executed for this. Um, both of these individuals uh, did over 35 years on death row and, um, you know, their health severely declined during this period of time. Um, Frank, though, he, he had a master's degree. He used every possible minute of his time to educate himself. Um, he wrote books and um, ultimately became extremely close with his faith. And I think that is a story that the clemency board should have heard and given more um, empathy to. But unfortunately, that's another one of the bigger problems we have with the uh, death penalty here is some of the barriers um, through the clemency board. Uh, don't hear these stories and, and essentially retrial these people again um, once they're at that point. I'll talk a little bit more about the Board of Clemency um, a, in just a few minutes. So um, there is another execution um, coming very soon, unfortunately. The, the next hearing for, um, it'll be essentially the warrant hearing um, for Murray Hooper, he's 76. Um, he's been incarcerated for 40 years. Um, and I have talked to his um, pen pals from all over the world. Some of him, some of them have been communicating with him for upwards of 15 years. And they can attest to this change of character and personality of him and um, hopefully we can bring some of that information to uh, his clemency hearing um, if they decide to move forward with this. But the attorney general has made it adamantly 
uh, had us made adamant statements on wanting to move forward with more executions before he leaves office. Uh, there are 20 individuals um, who have exhausted their appeals. And um, while he's in, there is no line, it is almost random selection of that 20 uh, who could be next, but it takes approximately 35 days after the, uh, the warrant is issued for the execution to happen. So um, once this warrant will be issued in October, the execution will likely be in November. Um, on top of the, the poor uh, ability we have to do executions, we also have people who are on death row who are innocent. Um, there is definitely a national movement around um, innocence with the Innocence Project. Uh, the Arizona Justice Project does a great job, but uh, the last two ex uh, exonerations that have been the most public are Ray Crone and Deborah Milkey. Um, Deborah Milkey did almost 23 years on death row in Perryville, and um, she was innocent. Uh, she does um, speech, uh, speaking engagements very rarely, um, but she is um, someone who is, I think, one of the longest serving um, women on death row, but one of the few that has been exonerated. Uh, there are two other women on death row. Um, one also is maintaining their innocence, um, but it's important to, to always think about the, the possibility of innocence and, and always what happens if we're wrong? Um, what happens if we are wrong in this situation? And many individuals, including Frank Atwood, maintain their innocence the entirety of their um, uh, life on death row. Uh, never once did he change his um, uh, belief of his personal innocence and, uh, of that crime. And um, it's important to know that DNA is sometimes the uh, exonerating factor. And when crimes take place, uh, which his did in 1983, there wasn't the science available. Ray Crone was exonerated by uh, forensic evidence. And that is um, the only thing that was able to get him off of death row. He did almost 10 years. Um, and, and these are people's lives. Deborah Milkey was also a victim. Her son was the victim um, who was uh, murdered. Uh, the individual who uh, was also convicted with her is also on death row. Um, but she is also a victim. Her son um, was the one who was uh, murdered. So not only did she do 23 years wrongfully convicted for the um, murder of her son, but um, she also lost her son in this process and immediately went to the loss of her son to prison. Uh, I can't imagine the trauma that comes with that kind of um, just exhaustion of the system, but having to wait so long um, after that to really properly grieve outside of prison. Um, but exonerations are also an important thing to think about. It For me personally, it doesn't matter if, you know, one out of a hundred are, are innocent. We don't know which one of that hundred are innocent. Um, it's better to say, okay, let's not do it at all in case we're wrong than it is to randomly choose. I personally am not of the belief that we should ever have that type of power over people to be able to pick and choose who lives and who dies. But even more important is to think about who are the people making these decisions. Um, and that brings me back to the Board of Clemency. So the Board of Clemency right now has four people on it. These people are appointed by the governor. Um, so they are appointed for a period of time and get to serve for years. Um, these are paid uh, government employees. They work 40 hours. I don't think they work on Fridays, but um, they oversee the parole and uh, clemency hearings. And Every single person except for Mina Mendez is a former law enforcement. 
uh, has a former uh, has a law enforcement background. Nina Mendez used to work at the Attorney General's office, so she's not very far from it. But these are people who have no true connections to impacted communities and people who are working in reentry, working to reduce recidivism. Um, mental health experts, sociologists, these are former law enforcement individuals. And I have seen now two of the clemency hearings and read dozens of reports of how this board functions. I've gone to the governor's office with a group of uh, other organizations to talk specifically about the composition of this board. And um, they do not operate under what they should for the, I don't think they understand what mercy is, but um, I think that having a diverse board means also having a board with different backgrounds, with different life experiences, um, people who can look at people um, outside of numbers and their background in the punishment system. Um, so this board is extremely problematic. However, we do have an election coming up that could de determine a different governor who could potentially appoint different people on this board that would allow us to essentially have a chance when someone goes to parole or have a chance when someone goes to clemency. Um, so we have a campaign right now it's uh, regarding the Board of Executive Clemency. We're asking individuals to call Governor Ducey, leave a message, leave any, send an email, a tweet, whatever you would like, and let him know that this board needs to be more diversified. It needs to give people a chance at the opportunity for mercy, um, which is essentially what this board is designed to do when um, death penalty cases come forward are, are heard. Um, this, this board has so much power um, they, the only way clemency is able to be granted is through this board. So the governor um, appoints these individuals. These individuals have to make a recommendation for clemency for the governor to be able to grant it. So if the governor, you know, is given the opportunity to, then you can put more direct pressure on one person. But because the governor has never been given an opportunity for clemency because the board will not recommend it, uh, he kind of can wash his hands and say, I, I didn't even have a chance, although he appointed these people. So it's important to know who is holding the power here. And while it's technically the governor, the governor can't make the recommendation until those board uh, members agree to it. And you need a, essentially a consensus. Um, but majority does rule. Uh, I only say you need a consensus because every single person on this board has voted this exact same way on the last two clemency hearings. Uh, so if you can move one, you might be able to move the other three. Um, but if you have three of the four, then you could get a recommendation. But at this point, um, there's very little chance and there hasn't been much success. There's been some studies done by the ACLU on how this board operates, and there are definitely some problems, racial disparities on how they grant uh, parole, but um, we really need individuals to, to reach out to the governor and let him know to diversify this board. He has, his uh, representatives have said that he does wanna fill it before he leaves office, that one vacancy. Um, so we've talked a lot about the death penalty, and I'm uh, very sorry, it's all very heavy information, but we can talk about some ways to prevent it. Uh, what, are, what, what can we do to slow this down? Because right now we're on a trajectory to keep on going until there is a change of um, represent, uh, re representatives. So States like Kentucky and Ohio have pushed for bills to remove people with serious mental illness from um, death row uh, or from the uh, death penalty entirely, and they have passed successfully with bipartisan support. This type of bill potentially could have spared someone like Clarence Dixon, who had a lifelong mental illness 
A condition like schizophrenia does not get better over time. On top of a, a disability, um, an SMI bill could have um, removed him and it could potentially remove a, a huge group of people who suffer from mental illness from the ever being the option of them um, getting to death row. Uh, the other things, that's like a major le legislative um, action. But the other thing that really has to happen here in Arizona is people need to talk more about it. Uh, we have to start educating each other on this issue. And um, my background in community organizing tells me the people who listen to me and hear what I say are my friends, are my family, are my coworkers, are people who are in my circle. Um, statistics say that that inner circle is more likely to believe information that's given to you. All the disinformation on Facebook is coming from your friends and family, right? So it's that same mindset of if we're sharing information with each other, we can share difficult subject matter with each other. We can recommend books, documentaries, read this article. Um, have you thought about how you're voting? That type of um, conversation is what is gonna be the biggest lift is to get more people on board um, on abolition uh, with the death penalty. We have to start having those conversations. Um, we also are a grassroots organization. We need volunteers. We need um, uh, people willing to come to um, representatives um, meetings with us to say, this is why I'm against the death penalty. I'm a constituent. Um, we need people to, um, uh, help us table and network with other groups and connect us to people who need to hear this information. Um, we need people to have difficult conversations. And I don't like politics. I worked in politics and I truly hate it. But I don't think of this issue as political. This is ethical. This is spiritual. This is um, a person to person conversation. Um, it doesn't have to be down the political lines. This can be in one case at a time. Um, and there are hundreds, if not thousands of different cases out there uh, to talk about, to spark conversation on. There's documentaries, there's all different kinds of things to start sharing information with. And we definitely have events coming up, um, speaking engagements happening, and then just different ways people can get involved. But we need y'all to share that information with your networks. Um, the other thing I just want to briefly mention, because I know we're kind of hitting time, is uh, the upcoming races and which ones are the most important. So, and which ones are directly impacting the death penalty in Arizona. So the governor we know makes the decisions on how to, or if they will grant clemency, but they can also put a moratorium on death penalty on the death penalty. So they can stop it altogether today if they wanted to. Um, we have two uh, um, candidates for governor, Carrie Lake and Katie Hobbs. No matter where you uh, stand politically, it's important to ask both candidates these questions. Um, there's not gonna be a debate. So this is a question that publicly probably wouldn't have gotten tons of attention, but they can be bombarded with it, with phone calls to their office, with Twitter um, messages, Facebook posts, whichever you'd like to do. Um, but people need to start asking candidates these questions. Um, I've gotten responses back from, um, uh, oh my gosh, I just realized I forgot to put the names on the attorney general, sorry. Um, but uh, you can ask these questions and you will get responses back from their campaign staff. Um, for Attorney General, it's Chris Mays and Abraham um, uh, Mahadath, I believe. And um, I know for a fact, I have a tweet response back from Abraham. He is uh, not opposed to the death penalty. He wants to move forward with uh, the death penalty. So these are, it's not public, um, but I, we have it on our Instagram page under our elections. So you can see how some of these candidates have responded. Um, Chris Mays has not given a response. Uh, Julie Gunnigal uh, is not for the death penalty. 
which is great news. And then Rachel Mitchell is for moving forward with death penalty sentences. So these are really um, pivotal uh, roles that these representatives potentially could have in determining how many people are going to be on death row. That starts at the county attorney level. Um, whether to move forward with execution warrants, that happens with the attorney general. Once those execution warrants move forward, it goes to the Board of Clemency at the very end of the whole ordeal. And that Board of Clemency is put together by the governor. That governor makes the decision on clemency or putting moratoriums. These are the most powerful positions in Arizona. And while the Pima County is also really important, Maricopa County has the majority of death penalty sentences in the state. We just have a higher population and a much higher budget. Uh, geographically, depending on where you live, a death penalty sentence might be um, a lot more likely in Maricopa because of the funding. The exact same crime may happen in Greenlee or Pima or Pinal, but because of their budgets, they're not built to support long trials. Um, so they will plead them down. And uh, in Maricopa, there's no problem with the budget as far as capital case trials, um, except for we know the defense doesn't get an adequate budget to do it. Uh, but that's why Maricopa County has the highest numbers of um, capital punishment sentences. So use your vote, if nothing else, and encourage other people to um, also vote for people who have the power to change things. Um, we have a petition going on that's going to the Board of Clemency, Governor Ducey, and the Attorney General on stopping executions in Arizona. Um, I'll drop some links um, when we're done with the presentation too. Um, we have another event coming up next week with, um, it'll be myself, um, Stacy Rector, who's an organizer for the death penalty in Tennessee. And then um, Brandon, his last name escapes me, uh, who's a death penalty organizer in Nevada. And we're having a conversation with EJ USA's Evangelical Network around the death penalty and, and what it looks like in other states. What are other states doing? And just so you can get more information on what does it look like in Tennessee? What does it look like in Nevada? Uh, what are we doing here? And kind of get a more in-depth look at how organizers are working on abolition. Um, definitely stay connected with us. If you have a smartphone, you can scan this QR code and it'll take you to all of our initiatives that we're doing, a donate link, our website, um, information on um, what's coming up. And, or you can visit our website, which we just rebuilt. It just launched last week. So y'all have, we'll have first eyes on our, our new information. Um, we'll, we'll keep it as up to date as we possibly can, but you can get more information about the Board of Clemency, um, our campaign to stop executions, and then just more ways to get involved. We have, um, we'll have a writing, program with individuals on death row um, coming up next year. So if there's anyone you know who may not be able to visit or do um, clergy work inside, but still wants to have um, some outreach with those on the row, you can absolutely reach out to us and we'll match you with someone who wants to have um, someone local. There's a lot of international support uh, for um, individuals on death row. And uh, they're incredibly um, just grateful people that they haven't been forgotten. And um, that is the most rewarding part of my day is when I get a little message from those that I'm talking to who are asking, you know, I hope you have a great weekend and uh, here's a book I'm reading or I just watched this movie. It just reminds you the the human that's still there, that they're, they're, they've never been anything different. Um, circumstances over decades definitely change and people change, um, particularly one of the people I've been talking to uh, has a white supremacist background. Um, they were very heavily um, organized in a white supremacist militia at the border here. And um, it's a completely different person who I'm talking to. Um, they are reading about faith. They are reading 
about race. They are um, teaching people on the yard about reentry, although they will never be able to leave. But they have made so much progress in, in becoming the person they wanted to be. And they have the time and opportunity to do that. Um, and it's just, I think once you're able to connect a person and tell that this, I tell my partner all the time, hey, guess what uh, so-and-so said? And uh, they now see this person, you know, my partner is not entirely, was not entirely opposed uh, to the death penalty until I started this work and started telling him about the, um, the people and the cases and all the different information. And once you have the whole story, you can make kind of a, a rounded decision about, all oh, right, maybe this is wrong and maybe we could do better here. But um, I think that's the really important part is sharing the information that we have and, and sharing the stories of who these people are now um, because they're being executed for, for something that happened so long ago for the most part, we're talking decades ago, and not really getting a chance to show their development as a person after they've aged, after they've had this experience, and really what what they still have to, to give to the community that they're in. Um, so much support, education, um, pastoring, I've heard it all, and I hope to continue to, to work with the individuals in these spaces to support them and, and advocate for them. Um, and I hope you all do too. Um, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Definitely um, get connected with us on social media, our newsletter. Um, you can sign up through all that, um, through all of our website stuff um, for our the newsletter and Instagram and all that. But um, I'd really love to answer any questions you have or questions you have about the advocacy work that we're doing. Um, and just hope that you were able to take some information away from this presentation that uh, gives you some more background on, on what's going on here. Yeah. 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 Awesome. That was awesome and i know a lot of this information and you just made it more just just made it come to life for me uh, you know it, it was just you added a level of realism from your deep involvement in this that um, even though i knew some of what you were saying i could feel it and that was all the difference so awesome awesome um, talking with or having you talk with us and I'm looking forward to the questions so I'm going to remove your spotlight so I can see people's raised hands um, feel free to raise a hand if you have a question or a comment um, for Kat and don't be shy okay we got Deacon Gay hey Kat it's Deacon Gay from Bridges Reentry I'm so happy to um, have the chance to hear your presentation this evening um, I, my question is about the, the um, parole board, the clemency board, and I was, I was um, really surprised to see the length of their um, service. I get that, okay, they're going to be appointed by the governor, but the, the, their terms just seem to be unbelievable. So how is that set? Is that from legislation? Is that, how, how do we, how would we go about changing that piece of it if we were to do that? Yeah, so it's definitely legislation. Um, it can be changed and there is quite a, a few attorneys who I've been talking to, um, most of which have been uh, capital representation attorneys. Uh, who are really, I mean, they've gone in front of this board so many times. Um, and if not representing uh, death penalty clients on um, parole and have had so many disappointing results. Um, the, there are essentially two options. Uh, for terms, it has to go through the legislature, but that could take some time depending on the, um, kind of political landscape that we're in. 
The next best thing is trying to find individuals who would be good fits for these roles. Mm -hmm. That's another area that um, after my meeting at the governor's office, they said, okay, well, who do you know? Who, who would want to be in these positions? And um, we have been working very hard, myself and a, a couple of other organizations to try and source candidates, but it is difficult um, to have diversity on this board at this point. Um, we only have one uh, vacancy. Once the governor does change hands, there could be potential, um, depending on who that governor is, there may be a multiple vacancies. Um, it can be, um, it, it's definitely undetermined whether what the chairperson Mina is going to do, they may step down um, so that the governor can fill a couple more roles or they might stay. Um, in that case, the other few appointed could also stay or they could go. A new governor though could change all the appointments. Um, so while we're stuck with the current term limits, um, I think trying to source different candidates so that we can buy some more time uh, is maybe the next best move. So if we can fill these roles with some better, more diverse people, meanwhile, we can make some legislative action behind the scenes to try and, and change those limits so that at some point, you know, when another governor changes things, uh, we're not in the same position of, okay, well, now we have to deal with, you know, four to eight years of a really bad clemency board. Um, that's a lot of people that go through that board, um, you know, on an annual basis. So it's kind of a two-step methodology of we got to fill the positions with people that you know, are going to be good in these roles and then work um, in the background trying to change the legislature statute or the ARS on this um, to change the limits. So it's a little bit more flexible. There's also potential to change the appointment process. That appointment process also has to go through uh, the Senate for confirmation. So the people who are looking to recommend have to get through two different gauntlets. The um, essentially the appointment by the governor and then through the Senate um, confirmation. So kind of a two-step problem, but a two-step solution at the same time. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Any Anyone else? I saw another hand go up a while ago and I didn't, oh, it's Bob Delaney. Okay, Bob. Uh, thank you, Kat. Um, I, I was curious what the justification is for the, uh, Department of Corrections to operate secretly um, and to not that that we can't know more about their procurement process and why it costs as much as it does. How is it that they can operate in secret as a public agency? So uh, there is an ARS statute written in on the secrecy of this. I'll have to pull um, up what it is specifically, but. Um, I personally think it's because of their really bad track record of botching executions. Uh, what's the best way to hide it, cover it up, make it make it as inaccessible as possible. Then you can't question the legitimacy of these drugs. You can't, I mean, you can question it, but you're not gonna get any information out of it. Um, there is an international organization that's been working really hard called Reprieve, and they have, done quite a bit of investigation to see if they can get any information on the lethal injection drugs. At one point we had talked about trying to do a campaign to like potentially get some folks working at DOC who we knew were underpaid, um, but there were too many uh, gray area legalities on trying to coax information out of people. Um, so it's been incredibly difficult to get information. Essentially, the only way people are going to get information is out of DOC. The staff that's working there may have more information that's uh, what's accessible to us um, in the, like there's a handbook that's accessible that tells you what the procedural uh, 
the procedural processes inside for executions, but it doesn't give you information on training. It doesn't give you information on the drug, when it was purchased, who it was compounded by, um, you know, where it was, you know, uh, sourced from. Uh, and this is a, a national problem um, as far as secrecy goes. There's several other states that have tried to push secrecy um, legislation in there and some have failed and some have been successful, but you're starting to see this as more executions start to get scheduled. Um, you know, hopefully we don't ever end up in a situation like Oklahoma, but there's a, there's enough compounded um, material available to us for a thousand um, uh, lethal execution drugs. So, um, it's something we have to keep fighting for and keep asking, but the best possible way to get information on it is from people from inside DOC. The problem is, is getting that information from them, you know, is very high risk. Um, they could lose their jobs. Um, there may be some legal consequences there. So it's gonna have to be a, a whistleblower, someone who comes out with that information, unless we can get rid of that um, statute uh, which probably would be a really long fight that I know people are already fighting, but um, press contacts that you have um, inside the correctional facilities in Florence specifically, uh, I believe they have a compounding room or place because they were able to re-compound the lethal injection drugs for uh, Clarence Dixon almost immediately when it came into question. So it has to be nearby likely on site. Uh, there could be also um, a contractor who they may be working with to compound these drugs. So there's a bunch of different uh, information sourcing options, but we trying to find those people is definitely the hard part. But um, that's my two cents on why. Um, and hopefully a fix is getting the information. Thank you. Any other questions? So you guys all know everything you need to know. <laughs> okay, Father Emmanuel has a question. Okay. I'm glad I had an opportunity to read the materials before this meeting today, because before now, I have had an impression that there is a good reason for the death penalty, being that I have traveled in so many areas of the third world, and I was convinced that the death penalty serves as a deterrent to murderers or other people who want to take the laws into their hands and take the life of innocent people or other people. They want to become the jury and the judge and the executioner. But uh, one thing I'm so glad about, first and foremost in the Bible, Jesus said, we should visit prisoners. He encouraged us to. And as a young man growing up in the Christian faith, I had always wondered, why would he say that? Prisoners are people who have done some bad stuff and they have been locked away. I thought you should say, well, let them get locked away and throw the keys away. But uh, I have come to see as I grew older that a lot of innocent people wrongly get incarcerated. You know, so apparently he must be making provision for people who hadn't done any wrong, but through some human error or wickedness or stuff, they get incarcerated. But then my catch all reason for saying, oh, no more, maybe we don't have to have that. And I believe so today is because from the advent of the DNA, I checked the Google before this meeting. It says 375 people have been cleared by DNA when a jury of 12 people unanimously found them guilty. A jury of 12 people were convinced that these guys were guilty. But for the DNA, they got released. 
Thanks. I wanted to ask, uh, I want to ask Kat or anybody else here who may want to contribute. Is there any proof really in the US, in the prison system, maybe Prebrenge, maybe uh, Dick Kim, also with Kat can say that the death penalty really, really serves as a deterrent. That's not maybe if, Kat, if you have uh, if you have interacted with people incarcerated who really committed this murder and they said, oh, I wish I did not do this. I regret this all my life. I wish I could do it all over again or something. Is there anybody, any but Kat or any of the other two of my ministers who want to say something about this? Uh, so what I can say from the conversations that I've had is, um, and, and just kind of the background information that I know is most people, uh, most people on death row didn't just go straight to death row. Um, they had multiple different instances um, with law enforcement, um, maybe jail, maybe prison sentences. And it is, as someone who's been there and refunded, it was not a deterrent to not go to prison. It was not a deterrent to, um, uh, to not commit a crime of passion, to not commit, like it, it's just not. Um, and there are national studies done and I'm, I can send you some information that have been conducted to show that the death penalty is not a deterrent. Most people, when they're committing uh, a crime, um, that's not the first thing they're thinking about. If it was, there would be a lot less crime, I'm sure. But also knowing that it takes 30, sometimes 40 years for a death sentence to be carried out, that doesn't deter people um, when they know that they can live another 30 to 40 years. Now, the conditions that they're having to live in are what I think deter them more. I have talked to individuals on death row who are not entirely against the death penalty. Um, they're serving um, time on death row who almost are, they're very aware that this is gonna be the rest of their life is this um, th these horrible conditions inside the prison. And the only way for that to end is for them to be executed or die in prison they would prefer the execution than having to continue to live inside of the uh, conditions in prison. And that's not saying that they wanna be executed, but it's saying that the deterrent, I think is knowing the conditions in prison are awful and terrible, but it's not ultimately the death penalty. And that's certainly not what people are thinking prior to uh, trial, prior to sentencing um, or as the crime is happening. And um, there definitely is national data out there that shows that it's not a deterrent. Yeah, and Emmanuel, on the DPAA website, there is a 30-minute um, uh, video that actually gets into this in more detail about um, how it is not an effective deterrent to crime. And the other thing, too, that I wanted to throw out at, uh, to you is that um, as in the case with uh, Murray Hooper that uh, Kat referred to, you know, um, we, we can't discount the redemptive nature that God offers to all of us. Um, there are, are there people in prison that deserve to be in prison? Of course, they've committed, you know, bad crimes, but the people that are in there aren't necessarily the same people that come out. You know, there's there's time in there. The ultimate goal of being in prison is for you to have time to think about what you've done and to repent um, and change your life so that you don't do that again when you come out. And our prisons, unfortunately, do not help them get to that um, position and do nothing to assist them overcome things like um, addictions or identify those struggling with mental illnesses that need uh, further care, um, not further incarceration. So um, those on death row are a, a microcosm of what is occurring in, in our prisons all, all over the, the world uh, in that um, we, are, we are not recognizing that no one is beyond redemption. 
And once we come to that conclusion, I believe that our um, system of incarceration will truly change. So, so you have thank said you. the prisons do not serve the purposes for which they were established. Absolutely you don't, not. You don't come out better mm -hmm. and you are not redeemed when you come out of the prison system. You come out better because of what you've done for yourself, not because of what the prison has done to help you come out better. Mm. So the people who come out like Kat, you know, who have turned their lives around, did it on their own with no help at all from the prison system. Um, you know, they, they did it on their own and with help of other people who were supporting them through this process, but not through uh adc or, or I, i'm speaking for you cat i'm sorry i i know about other people um that have come out too that it's the same same situation is that you know they do it in spite of being incarcerated and kim you're one thousand percent right and you're <laughs> you're absolutely welcome to steer me there the the people who helped me um you know get my life back on track were um, the person who picked me up or the people who picked me up, which was my aunt and uncle. Um, my uncle was a, a former sheriff deputy in the 70s and my aunt was a public school teacher. Um, they invested in me and helped me and, and that was what gave me the opportunity to better my life. But it was not the system. It was not probation. It was not parole. It was not um, the super poor infrastructure that's set up for people when they are released. And the one major um, like bit of information I think that's also important to share is many of the people on death row were victims themselves in different capacities. Um, we have individuals who were um, sex workers. We have people who were um, forced into um, just these terrible um, living circumstances and um, mostly because of poverty. Um, Clarence Dixon um, was forced to eat dog food when he was a child. Uh, there are so many stories of neglect, abuse, um, and there was no infrastructure for them when they were victims to get the help they needed, the support they needed, the resources they needed to overcome that or, or heal from that trauma. Um, so when I say we're creating victims in this system, we're, we're penalizing people who were already institutional victims before they even got here because the systems that we have are not set up to handle the, the populations that we have that need mental health, substance abuse, treatment, um, and, and most importantly, support networks. Um, you know, for me, it was changing the, the group of people who, um, you know, I needed to be around productive people. I needed to be around people who wanted to foster my development and give me chances. Uh, the probation system is not designed to do that. The parole system is not designed to do that. It's designed to bring you back in and keep you kind of in this circle of in and out, in and out, in and out. And the countless women and men that I've worked with, it is the same story over and over and over again. And at any point in time, uh, we all have realized and, and some of the, the closest people um, I've worked with in the last few years have been exonerated, have been um, in and out or served 10, 20 plus year sentences and said, that's enough for me. I'm going to stay out and I'm going to help someone else stay out. Um, and I've seen the trauma that comes from incarceration that makes people unable to network, unable to put themselves in positions for upward mobility because they've been institutionalized. So when I think of you know, the whole big problem of the system, it's looking at that initial pipeline of people um, before they even get to death row, how do we deter them from ever getting there? It's starting with reinvestment in community, starting with uh, better housing, better education, better healthcare, better um, you know, support networks for people um, who are going through addiction and mental illness. It's holding all of those people and taking care of them so that they don't fall into uh, the initial stages of crime um, because they're hungry or because they're in a bad situation. Um, and that's really the takeaway that I have had from talking with so many people on death row is 
Um, you know, I've heard stories of trauma and adoption. I've heard stories of um, abuse and neglect and all these different things. And at every point I can point to a system that failed them before they ever got into the justice system. And that's the biggest thing is that when we look at victims, we have to look at the whole scope of victims. And that means, you know, their experiences are also valid. Um, and it's also, you know, looking at on the victim side, there's often not support for victims to heal after such a traumatic event happens. They are in this uh, capital punishment trial. They're going to go through decades of having to talk about this process over and over and over again. And that doesn't heal wounds. I think it festers um, anger and pain. And a lot of times these victim advocacy organizations are incentivizing victims through uh, financial compensation. They're also, you know, saying, hey, this will make you feel better if you go for the harshest punishment or the worst punishment. This retributive, um, you know, action is going to give you some peace. And then that's just not the truth. Um, there are so many victims out there who have advocated against the death penalty and have not been heard. Um, I've talked to um, plenty of murder victim families who, uh, you know, their brother, their sister, their mother, their father were the victim of a crime um, that resulted in the loss of their life. And they didn't want to push forward with capital punishment. Um, they didn't want somebody else's family to suffer the same pain they did. And um, sometimes they're not heard. And that's, you know, definitely something that isn't factored in is that there are families who are victims who don't want this option. Um, but, you know, it, once it's in the court's hands, you know, it's a much more difficult thing. But if you're looking at the restorative justice process and looking at how do we prevent these measures, it starts at the very beginning of that pipeline. It starts with, all right, let's try and problem solve these things before they get so bad. And this person's been in so many times that this is the last stop they make is, is death row. And I hope that, you know, as this movement and this conversation, you know, continues outside of, you know, this meeting that we share information on, there were victims too. They needed someone to advocate for them and they didn't have that. They needed those resources and didn't get them. Clarence Dixon was 48 hours away from help. Uh, he was off his medication in a schizophrenic state and committed his crime when he should have been in a state hospital. It was the um, Maricopa County Sheriff's Office who didn't come pick him up to take him to the hospital. It was that one gap that cost somebody their life because of the how broken the system is. It's not just Clarence who carries responsibility for that. It's the system as a whole who didn't fill that gap, who didn't pick him up, who didn't make sure he was on his medication to prevent that crime. And you know, looking at that whole story, you see more than just one victim there. You see a bunch of different problems that are systemic and um, are not just on the burden of one person. We're getting close to uh, the end of our time. We have a time for one more short question. If anybody has a pressing question you wanna ask, now is the time to raise your hand. Nadine? Hopefully this is short. I'm just, um, and I'm, I'm appalled at the fact that we execute people who have severe mental illness. Who else on death row currently, or how many people in death row also have an SMI diagnosis? Um, I've talked to one of the attorneys, um, who does a lot of the uh, litigation for them. And he said there's approximately four to five. Um, there could be a few more who just didn't get the proper testing. Um, and those, you know, that's not even looking at the pipeline of incoming um, individuals who are looking at capital litigation. Uh, if you all read the headlines and see, there are quite a few cases 
um, coming up to go to trial that have postpartum depression factored in, that have, um, you know, uh, bipolar disorder, that have multiple different issues related to severe mental illness. Um, so I would say at least four to five in already on the row. And then, you know, the other is a question mark because we won't know until we get into trial what all those specific conditions are. But, um, you know, Clarence, I think is the one of the worst circumstances I have ever heard where it was so well documented that this was like a lifelong illness. And on top of it, when he lost his sight, um, his I, I personally believe that his condition worsened because he was unable to have any perceptions of what was actually going on visually um, due to the blindness. And then his last words being, I don't know who this Deanna is, who was um, the victim in this case. I don't know her. He, up until the very end on that table, he did not know who she was. And to me, when you have such a, a separation of reality that this is not someone that should have been executed. This is someone who should have been in a hospital for the last 40 years, who should have been given help. Um, you know, that's, that's the reality of what we're dealing with is it's not, um, it, it's just not uh, acceptable to, to see what's happening. Um, I will say that we will be working incredibly hard next year on an SMI bill campaign. We're hoping to work with um, the mental health community, NAMI and COPA and several other organizations I've reached out to, to start having bigger conversations around mental illness. This may spare, you know, four to five people right now, but the capital litigation is gonna go on indefinitely until we abolish the death penalty. So it could potentially prevent more people from ending up on the row and having to go through what Clarence did. So four or five people is huge when you think about the, the long-term, if this is legislation, now we've, we've saved and prevented more people from, from getting here. And the numbers for, individuals on death row in Arizona, uh, 257,000 individuals have a serious mental illness in this state, just in Arizona. Um, overall, that's 3.6% of the population. So if this SMI bill, if we're able to get it um, through the legislature and, and get it passed, any uh, Arizonan who has an SMI designation would be safe. And and not that it's an extremely high rate, but it's prevention. Um, that's what I think the most important thing is, is that we're working on narrowing this pipeline to as little as we can get it until it's not needed anymore. It's not worth it. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for our campaign next year, working on an SMI bill. Um, we'll be really, really pushing it because I think it's possible, especially when you see uh, states with similar political compositions like Kentucky and Ohio, who can get bipartisan support on this bill and it will pass. Um, it's been successful there and I'm working with the organizers in those states who have um, the expertise and, and got it done to build our own campaign similar to theirs to get that same bipartisan support and get it through. Thank you, Kat. And let's all give Kat a round of applause for an incredibly wonderful discussion and uh, information that you provided. I'm so grateful to you um, for being here. And um, you know, I know Dan uh, Petsmeyer, who founded the death penalty uh, alternatives to Arizona. And when he said, oh, I've got this crackerjack person, you've got to have her come and talk. I thought, okay, Dan, whatever you say. And he was absolutely right. Um, you did a, a wonderful job. And I'm so grateful that you had the time to be with us tonight. Um, before we close with a prayer, I have a special prayer from Sister Helen um, Prejean um, uh, uh, concerning the death penalty. So before we close, I just want to remind the Sacred Journey group that next week, Debbie, um, is that right? Debbie is going to be our, our, um, our uh, guide 
uh, into um, human trafficking. Um, so that can be an, an interesting topic and she'll have some things for us to look up and review before next week. And then the following week, we have a guest speaker, uh, attorney Kevin Heed, who is the founder of um, Restorative Justice for Arizona. And that's going to tie in with what um, uh, Kat is talking about, ways to avoid um, uh, incarceration altogether through restorative justice techniques. And uh, it should be very interesting. So um, I hope that you, those of you who are guests today, like Nancy and, and Jean and, 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 and Pat or Pam, um, you know, that you guys will come back for more um, the end of the month. So if there's nothing else pressing, I'm going to close this with prayer, and then I will stop the recording. Let us pray. God of compassion, you let your rain fall on the just and the unjust. Expand and deepen our hearts so that we may love as you love, even those among us who have caused the greatest pain by taking a life. For there is in our land a great cry for vengeance. As we fill up death rows and kill the killers in the name of justice, in the name of peace. Jesus, our brother, you suffered execution at the hands of the state, but you did not let hatred overcome you. Help us to reach out to victims of violence so that your enduring love may help heal. Holy Spirit of God, you strengthen us in the struggle for justice. Help us to work tirelessly for the abolition of state-sanctioned death and to renew our society in its very heart so that violence will be no more. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Kat, so much. Really appreciate all you had to share today. Good night, everybody. Good night.